Well, good morning, church, and it's so good to have all of you join us here this morning on Church Online. Uh, we're here to, to worship our King, so we've got a couple songs that we're going to sing and hear the words spoken. Uh, but before we start singing, I want to share a verse with you all, and it's from Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart celebrates, and I give thanks to him with my song. And as we've gathered today, and we have folks gathering in the parking lot here in just a few moments, um, we're going to be singing these songs together while we are apart. We are worshiping him in the spirit. So this first song today is uh, it's just a great song of praise. It's glorious day. That was very who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you, and I was breathing, but now. heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. Together I stand, and I 
again.
out your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Father, as we've come, we've come to lift up our praise. With every breath in our lungs, we come to praise you. With every action that we do in our lives, we praise you. We worship you, mighty King. As we come to this time of offering is yet another way that we worship you by giving what you gave first. By taking your example of sacrifice, we apply it to our lives. We sacrifice those things to you, God. We love you, Heavenly Father, and we pray this all in Jesus' mighty, precious name. Amen. Well, church, in just a moment, we're going to have our, our offering video play, and this is just a way that you can continue to give uh, to Second Reformed Church, and it's whether you want to do text or email. Well, you can't do email, but text or online giving, or you can drop off your check in the mail is another option, too. Uh, so we're going to go to our offering time, and following that, will be a message from Pastor Scott. Red Rover, let Jason come over. Do you remember that game, Red Rover? What an awful game. So one team would lock hands and then they would agree who it was from the other team that they wanted to call over and in unison they would sing out, Red Rover, Red Rover, let, let Jason come over. And then Jason would look and he'd identify either where was the weakest link that he wanted to break through that line or if he happened to be amped up on sugar and teenage boy testosterone, he would identify the strongest part of the link. And he'd say, I'm going there. And then he would run as fast as he can and like Saquon Barkley trying to break through the, the defensive line of the Dallas Cowboys, he would launch himself into those hands trying to break through. 
and inevitably the game would end the same way. It would end with a torn rotator cuff, or it would end with a dislocated shoulder, or a broken collarbone, or a, a concussion. But we didn't know what concussions were back then. So Sawyer, Michigan, Tower Hill Church Camp, Red Rover, Red Rover, let Jason come over, and Jason came over, and he was amped up on sugar that day amped up on teenage boy testosterone. And instead of going through the arms, he decided he would launch himself and try and go over the arms. And when he jumped, he didn't just jump perpendicular, he kind of jumped horizontally. And he took out about four kids that day. It is a terrible game. And so eventually what happens in Red Rover is that People playing recognize this is just not worth it. It is not worth winning this game to go to the emergency room. And so they would hold hands, but they would hold hands loosely. And then when someone would come and try and break through their, their fortress, they would quickly let go. And, oh, you broke through. So the church is playing a modern game of Red Rover. The church is called to unity. God calls us to be a distinctively Christian community set apart from the community of the world. He calls us to lock arms with one another. He calls us to, to maintain the unity of the faith. And there are all kinds of things that threaten our unity that we are called to stand against. The unity of the church is a much bigger thing than we recognize. When I perform weddings, I will say, uh, what God has united, no one may divide. The church, we, are something that God has united. And in the same way that a marriage is sacred, the church is sacred. We are a sacred family, and what God has united, no one may divide. So we are going to uh, be looking at a portion of Scripture today that really follows some of the passages that we've been looking at the last few weeks uh, about God's call to unity. Join me as we pray uh, and prepare to do that. Father God, we want to thank you for this day, and uh, we thank you that we are uh, able to gather in the parking lot today, and we also thank you for the gift of technology that we can do this online worship. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the gift of community. We thank you for the gift of belonging. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your spirit, which binds us together in love and grace. And we pray that you would protect us from all that threatens to, to divide. Now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. And uh, we've been looking at a portion where he calls us to put on compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and to bear with one another and be forgiving and be loving, he gives us the blueprint on how it is that we are called to be this distinctive Christian community. These are the things that God calls us to do. And so this morning, we're going to look at another scripture that, that oddly enough, sounds a lot like Colossians. We're going to turn to Ephesians, and what we're going to find out is that this, this same theme pops up in also the letter to the Ephesians. So as it turns out, these themes are, are, not, uh, are not relevant to just one church. It is relevant to every church. So we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bear with one another in love. 
make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. So come with me to a home in Rome. It is the home where Paul is under arrest. Paul is under arrest, and he is, he's being tried on some trumped-up charges, and he doesn't know what fate awaits him. He, he probably is, is fairly confident that it's not going to be good. And so he's in the last days and weeks of his life. But as we look at Paul, what we notice is that he, strangely enough, is not very troubled. He doesn't seem very anxious. In fact, if we listen in, we hear him say these words as he's writing a letter, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul's not afraid of of whatever fate awaits him. But if we look at Paul, what we do notice is that he's very concerned about something. He's praying and and he almost seems troubled about something, but it's not about his fate. And we look and we notice that Paul takes a a quill and he begins to to write. And he's writing a letter to a church, a church in Philippi. It's one of the churches that he planted. And he finishes that letter and he starts another letter, the letter to the church in Colossae. He finishes that letter and he starts to write another letter, the, the church to the church in Ephesus. You see, what's on Paul's mind is this this infant church that he has planted in these different cities. And he's praying for this church, and he's concerned about these churches. He's concerned about all of the things that threaten the church, and the list is great. He's concerned about false teachers. He's concerned about about bad doctrine and, and untruth seeping into the church. He's concerned about idolatry. He's concerned about the the pagan culture infiltrating the church and and the church gradually adopting some of these pagan cultures and kind of meshing them with, with Christian culture. He's concerned about all of these things, and so he writes a letter to the church. The letter to the church in Ephesus is an encouraging letter. And the first half of the letter, what for us is three chapters, Paul just goes on and on about what a gift it is that we've been given. To be be Christians, to be chosen, to be loved by God, to be adopted into his family, and to have all of this done by grace, not by virtue of anything that we've done, but everything that God has done for us. We are are part of this family of God, and we have this glorious inheritance, and and we're saved not through works, but by grace. He goes on and on. We are loved. We are loved wide, and we are loved long, and we are loved high, and we are loved deep. How great it is to belong to the family of God. And it's not until he's halfway through the letter that he writes his very first Command. Finally, he gets to something that he actually is saying, church, I want you to do this. So of all the things that he might be concerned about, about the church, about idolatry and about false teaching and, and, and false doctrine and about uh, heresy and about um, oh, cult, the culture seeping into the church, about all the things, the thing that he chooses to address The thing that he's most concerned about is division. Make every effort, he writes, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So the question that is before us is how do we do that? Well, he's given us the blueprint, be completely humble, be gentle, be patient. 
He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. He just has gone on and on about the, what it is that we've received. And now he says, live your life worthy of all that you've received. How can we possibly live lives that are worthy of such incredible gifts that we've been given? I mean, do I need to, to surrender my bodies to the flame? Would that be enough for me to, to live a life worthy of the calling? Do I need to do something heroic, something that's going to be remembered for, for years and years to come, something that's going to get my name recorded in the, the books of history? Would that be worthy enough? Paul, tell us, what is it that, that we need to do that's going to be worthy of the calling we have received? Well, this is what he says. Be completely humble. Be gentle. Be patient. Bear with one another. And then he says this, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That will be worthy of the calling that you have received. That's it. Be completely humble. Be gentle, be patient, bear with one another, keep the unity of the faith in the, in the bond of peace. That's it. That's what we need to do to be worthy of this calling. That's it. So it causes me to ask the question, do we underestimate the importance of unity? Is it possible that, that unity, that when we maintain the unity in this distinctively Christian way, in this Christian community, that that is much more heroic than we, than we actually think? I think what Paul is saying is that the answer to that question is yes. Uh, as you and I are both aware, the world is groaning right now. The world around us is groaning. We are becoming more and more divided from one another. The world is becoming more and more polarized. Uh, I heard somebody say uh, a couple weeks ago, no, actually a couple months ago, uh, that, that he believed that we were actually heading towards civil war in our country. And I heard that and I thought it was absolutely absurd. Like, what are you talking about, civil war? And that was pre-COVID, and that was pre-all of the, the racial tensions that exist today. And now, several months later, I, I think about his comment, and I don't know what it is, what the sparks are that lead to civil war, but I do wonder if we're seeing some of those sparks today in the, the divided, polarized world that we're living in that is only becoming more divided and more polarized by the day. And in this reality, God plants a church. We are planted in this reality of a, a country and a culture that is becoming more and more polarized, more and more divided by the day. We, the church. And what is it? What is the number one thing that Paul is writing to us and telling us? Make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In 1967, 1967, John and Sandra Steffen decided to adopt a little girl. They had been trying to have children and they were unable to do so, and so they decided to adopt a little girl and they named her Cynthia Louise. And by virtue of that legal adoption, Cynthia Louise became their daughter. And three years later, they decided to adopt a rock star of a son. In 1970, they adopted a little boy, and they named him Scott Allen Steffen. And Scott Allen Steffen became their son through the legal process of adoption. Cynthia Louise, born in a different place, born to different biological parents of different ethnic background, and very different from Scott Allen Steffen, 
The two of them, Scott Allen and Cynthia Lewis, became brother and sister by virtue of John and Sandra adopting them. Because they shared the same parents, they are now brother and sister. Friends, we in the church are brothers and sisters by virtue of the fact that God has adopted us into his family. We share a common father. And so what that means is that the unity that that we enjoy, it is a gift that God gives us. We don't need to manufacture our unity. It is not something that, that we produce. Our unity is grounded in the fact that God has adopted us, that we are his children, and being his children makes us brothers and sisters. So unity is a gift that God gives us. But unity is also an obligation. So it's true that I don't have to manufacture unity with you. We don't have to produce that. But what we do have to do is keep it. We have to preserve it. We have to maintain it. I urge you, Paul writes, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. One of the greatest gifts that we, the church, can offer the world right now is showing them the power of God by demonstrating that that there is a union that is stronger than any difference that exists. Pick any difference. I don't care what it is. Uh, Our different racial background, our different political beliefs, our different uh, opinions, uh, our different social class, our different income, our different education, our different age, our different background. The union that we have in Christ supersedes all of that. In Christ, we are one. There is one God the Father. There is one Lord. There is one baptism. I was baptized in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And my guess is if you are a believer, you're a member of the church, you were baptized in the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And because we share the same name, because we're baptized in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Spirit, we are brothers and sisters. So the unity that we have is a gift. It's given to us. We don't have to earn it. But we have to fight like crazy to maintain it and to keep it. Because we are in a game of Red Rover and the stakes are much higher than just a children's game. There are all kinds of things threatening the unity of the church. They're threatening us from the outside, but what's even greater is that they are threatening us from the inside. And we live in a culture where where we treat unions very loosely. It's kind of like that Red Rover game where, where we have kind of adopted the mindset that, you know what, if I want to let go of your hand, I can do so. If you say something that I don't like, you do something that offends me, it's okay to let go. And when it comes to the church, well, there's plenty of other churches I can go to. Friends, I, I think God wants more than that. He wants more from us than that. He wants us to make every effort to preserve the unity because the the unity that we enjoy was purchased for us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And when we are so quick to to just let go of one another's hands at the first sign of any challenge, any difficulty, we're really trotting on, on what Jesus has done for us. What God has united, no one may divide. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father God, we thank you for the gift that you've given us, the gift of unity. And Lord, we pray that uh, you would strengthen us so that we would do everything in our power to keep the unity of the Spirit. And Lord, we ask that your church, our church, would shine in this world that is becoming more and more polarized, more and more divided from one another. We ask this in the the power of your name. Amen.
blessing and blessed, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of
So friends, um, next Sunday, we're going to have a guest preacher. His name is Vodi Bakum, uh, a, a preacher whose sandals I am unworthy of tying. Uh, Vodi Bakum, Pastor Vodi Bakum was a pastor of a church in Houston, Texas, and now he is the Dean of Theology in Zambia uh, at an African University. In a, Vodi Bakum gave a, a sermon about racial reconciliation. And it really plays on the same theme that I've been talking about this morning about unity and how, how God gives us unity. It's not something that we manufacture. And he's going to say the same thing about racial reconciliation, that in Christ we are reconciled racially. And now our job is to live that out. And so I really want to encourage you next week to tune in online. 
um, to hear what uh, Vodi Bakum has to say. So uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Amen.